Dirt. What do you think about dirt? Is dirt just something that you get on when you fall playing soccer or, or uh, chasing your sibling around the house before you get yelled at, you know? Um, we have a, an incredible um, relationship with dirt. I like to call it soil. I don't call it dirt. I call it soil. And in our, in our culture, we generally think of, of soil as something that we need to put in and we, we think it's ishy and it's you know, grubby and, you know, uh, uh, very smart people, very smart people don't talk about soil. If, if, we're, if we're cerebrally minded and we're academically, you know, advantaged, oh, we don't talk about mundane things like soil. But did you know that there are more living beings in a handful of healthy soil than there are people on the face of the earth? Now, if I said there were more living beings in a, healthy, in a handful of healthy soil um, than there are people in, in uh, where are we, Chestnut Ridge, uh, New York, you would say, wow, that's, that's a lot. But then if I said uh, there were more living beings than there are people in New York, wow, that's a lot. And then if I said, but there are more living beings than there are people in the United States. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> but actually, there are more living beings in a handful of healthy soil than there are people on the whole earth. <laughs> now say it with me. Wow! If you look at an electron microscope at the soil, right? We're going to look into this electron microscope, a, a, a regular, you know, little magnification microscope that you look under for, you know, to look at hydrogen and, and things like that. You know, they're not powerful enough. Electron microscope is powerful enough because many of these little critters are simply uh, very, very simple. You know, little protozoa and little fungi. And, and bacteria and things, and strange little names like actinomycetes, and gibberellin, and azobacter. You know, of course, we know the big ones, like the, the little roly polies and the earthworms. You know, you can see those. But there are all of these other beings that we can't see. And if you're looking at it, like on a microscope, you're looking in the, in the visor, and you know, it's a round circle here, and, and you're looking in there, and in from 2 o'clock comes this kind of you know, four-legged cow-looking thing, you know, these, these kind of grazing little cilia, little, you know, little things. You see, uh, it, it's kind of a swampy setting, you know. He's kind of got hip boots on him. He's, he's kind of slogging through here. He's eating, he's salivating, you know. He's grazing on, 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 on. Okay, so he, he kind of cow-like, you know, going, going along. And all of a sudden, from 10 o'clock into the sphere that we're looking at, 10 o'clock, charges a six-legged, <laughs> narwhal-looking thing with a with a, a, a spear out the front of his head. And he comes charging in here and impales the <laughs> boop, the boop, the thing, you know, <laughs> impales him in the side and, and, and uses his spear as a straw to <laughs> suck out and desiccate the whole uh, vitreous, aqueous body of this, of this, Boop, 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 the thing, you know? And then, all of a sudden, from 6 o'clock into this sphere we're looking in, charges a 12-legged centipede-looking thing with scissors on the front of his head. He comes in and whops off the head of the boop, boop, boop thing, munches it, and eats it up. This is going on all the time. And what's amazing is that... Generally, in our culture, we don't put any value on this unseen, unseen world of beings. I mean, you know, when's the last time you saw a, uh, 
you know, you saw a, 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 a TV show, for example. Uh, we don't have a TV in our house, so I don't even know what this comes from. But anyway, imagine, imagine presenting a business plan to a banker. You're going to start a business, okay? And you, you, you create this business plan with your, you know, your balance sheets and your projected uh, profit and loss statements and all that. And you take it in to your banker. The banker's sitting there, you know, in this big mahogany chair. He's got this big oval table. And you sit across from him, right? And you present the business plan. He looks at it, you know, and he looks to it. All of a sudden, he puts it down, and he looks at you across the desk, and he says, Wow, this is the best business plan I've ever seen. We're going to be a millionaire because I'm going to be your partner. And you feel pretty good. Wow, he's going to give me some money. We're going to start this business, and we're going to be up and running, you know? And, and, and then all of a sudden, he gets this frown, and he says, But now, I have one very important question for you. What is this business? going to do to the actinomycetes in our community? <laughs> what is this business going to do to the earthworms in our community? Now, wouldn't you agree with me that what happens to the earthworms and the actinomycetes, this invisible world that, 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 that we all are completely and utterly dependent upon, wouldn't you agree with me that that is a world that we should consider in our business plans, in all of our, our, our architecture and our thinking and our planning for vacations and whatever we're going to do? Don't you think that world should be consulted? Yeah, it's kind of important, isn't it? But you know what? That world does not even enter into Wall Street P&L statements. It doesn't enter into balance sheets. Number two. Next item on my agenda. All right? Is we have this idea, unfortunately, uh, many in our culture, that Environment, environmental uh, stewardship and care and humans are incompatible things. That, um, that, that, that in order to have a healthy ecology and a healthy environment, to have a healthy earthworm population and actinomycetes and all that, the best way to have a healthy population of this invisible world and, this, and, and, the, and the physical manifestation of the trees and the grass and the flowers and, and all those things that we see in our bodies, in order to have a healthy manifestation of that, to have a healthy ecology, we need to get humans out of it. And so the only place there can be a really cool environmental experience is in a wilderness area or a national park that excludes people. Are you with me? You know, I'm not talking French here, am I? All right, all right. you're with me. Okay. And so we have, so, so what we do is, as a culture, we come to this, this, this whole environmental kind of a thought of ecological environmental stewardship. Um, Bringing, bringing our old um, uh, Western reductionist linear, I'm going to use some big words here, but I, I, I think everybody steps up to the plate here, so I don't, I don't talk down, I talk up, and you know, I want you to come up, all right? Um, um, you know, Greco-Roman Western reductionist compartmentalized, systematized, fragmentized, democratized, parts-oriented, disconnected, uh,
as a culture, we manifest this, this uh, what I call living apartheid, segregated thinking. We, we show it in the fact that we even now uh, uh, zone so that if you can live in a 1,500 square foot house, a nice big house, you can live over in this part of town. But if you can't afford a 1,500 square house, and you can only afford a 1,000 square house, foot square house, then you can live over in this part of town. Because, I mean, we wouldn't want the 1,000 square footers. <laughs> 1,500 square footers. I mean, that, that just wouldn't do. And so we, we have parsed our, our, our mental segregation. We have parsed it and, and pieced it out to where it, it's reflected in the kind of segregated living and thinking that we do. And so we don't want to put the residences next to the retail places, uh, and we don't want the manufacturing places next to residential areas, so we segregate them all uh, way apart from each other so that the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker are now disembodied from the village, and now everybody gets to spend petroleum to drive to all their, you know, their distant uh, segregated places because nothing is walkable anymore because perish the thought that we would have a cobbler uh, actually plying the, his, his trade of making shoes, that's what a cobbler is, right, okay, um, in, 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 in the first floor of his house where he actually lives and can just walk downstairs to his shop. Well, that would never be. And so we bring that kind of, of, of segregated thinking into some of these bigger issues of how do we live? How do we interact with nature? And so we have this idea that, that nature is some sublime thing over here, segregated and apart from humans. Like, like I'm not part of nature. Nature is something that I, I talk about over here. I read books about nature. I go, I go out of my house. I get in my car and I drive a hundred, a thousand miles to Colorado and go to, or, or, or Wyoming, Yellowstone Park. I go to nature. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> And, and, and so we, we have this unbelievable compartmentalized view. I want you to learn that word, compartmentalized. It's a powerful word. It will stand you in good stead because in my view, part of what the Waldorf program is all about is, is non-compartmentalizing our life. Right? To understand that it's all one big picture. We are nature. Nature is not out here somewhere that we drive to go visit. We, we are creating nature in here. So how do we design a building with its, with its acoustics, its energy, the, 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 the materials that we use to build it? How do we, how do we design it to fit in to nature that we're a part of? We are a part of nature. We are immersed in nature. And so, so the question begs us, well then, well, so what is our role? I mean, we're, you know, we're really intelligent, cerebral, you know, we're smart beings, you know. Uh, we're, you know, maybe we're smarter than the actor of my CTs. And, and so the question comes up, well, well then what are we for? What are you for? What am I for? What is our role in this, in this nest? We're a part of this nest. We're a part of this ecological womb. Whether we like to or not, we can't abdicate responsibility. You know, we've got a we've got a culture that thinks that we can, um, you know, we can cavalierly sail off into some Star Trek uh, future and sever our responsibilities within this nest. And we can we can cast off this old this old. Uh, archaic, unnecessary anchor that moors us to the soil. Ah, oh, that's dirty stuff. I don't want to be a part of that. So I'm going to, 
I'm gonna go get a pop a protein breakfast pill and um, <laughs> you know and eat some uh, genetically modified uh, pseudo irradiated prostituted <laughs> adulterated reamalgamated <laughs> pseudo food <laughs> you know from Archer Daniels Midland and, 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 and we're gonna we're gonna sail cavalierly off into this this wonderful you know uh, fantasy never never land where where we don't have to get dirty. And we don't have to think about the beings that are in us. You know, each one of us has three trillion bacteria inside of us. In fact, um, Massachusetts Institute of Technology has a TED talk now talking about uh, that we are actually only 15% human and we're 85% non-human. <laughs> So, so, I've got problems. You've got problems. I've got people that think I'm a lunatic. I've got some people that think I'm really smart. All right? You know, it goes, with, it goes with life. And so what I bring to this nature is I bring, I bring a resiliency and a capacity. So, let's, let's talk about it. Let's get, let's get practical. So what that means is, part of my responsibility to my fellow humans is to build in a caring, loving, forgiving, appreciative atmosphere so that whatever's going on in their situation, the teasing, the pimples, the baldness, the chemotherapy, whatever it is, we're building emotional forgiveness and wrapping them up in abundant blessing and grace and forgiveness to encourage them in the shocks of life so they can take a bad grade, a bad day, a bad sickness, and they can bounce back as a show of the power and the abundance of this nasty living. Living things have the ability to heal. You get a wound, you get a scab, you, you can put some salve on there, wait a little bit, put a, a band, you know, your your, your, your little brothers and sisters, you know, they have owies now. You've outgrown the owie stage, right? But you, you put the Band-Aid on and you wait a little while and boy, pretty soon, you see that healing skin come up around it, right? And then it, you know, it grows up, it roils over, it gradually gets smaller and smaller. And then, and then finally, just before the scab comes off, it gets so itchy and you want to scratch it. And that's all a part of life's healing capacity. Machines don't heal. But our culture views food and it views plants and animals from a decidedly mechanical view. That's why you go down to this, you can go down to the store and you can buy food that's been all pieced apart in processing and then put back together with Fortified vitamin K and fortified this and fortified that. You know what? Real food doesn't need any fortification because it hasn't been torn apart in the first place. Hmm. And so on our farm, we dare to ask the pig, pig, what is the essence of pig? What makes a happy pig? What allows us to present a, a habitat that allows you, <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Pig, to fully express your pigness. <laughs> because it's in the expression of pigness that we have the full expression of pig, which, guess what, allows us to enjoy the full expression of bacon <laughs> and pork chop. <laughs> But see, our culture doesn't ask that question. <laughs> the USDA and the FDA and the industrial, the Monsantos and the Tysons and the, and the uh, industrial food community, they just ask, you ready for the question they ask? They only ask, how can we grow it faster, fatter, bigger, cheaper? That's all. That's Nature tends toward, toward a place of balance and honoring the biology and, and, and the life balance of beings. You know, and actinomycetes, the size of you or, or oh my God. 
would be would, would not be a very effective after no more teachers because he wouldn't be able to interact with the gibberellos. So preserving the pigness of the pig creates this wonderful sacred place for food. See, we tend in our culture to view food as just inanimate stuff. When we go eat, when we go eat, is this just stuff? Is this just a mechanical thing? You know, at 12 o'clock, you know, my elbow starts to... <laughs> <laughs> You know, when I smell certain things, you know, my elbow starts to back. <laughs> See, this is not mechanics. It is fundamentally biological. And so when we, when we offer organic pizza and pizza from a mechanical viewpoint, and we tease somebody that picks the organic pizza that, honor, that honors all of the ingredients and the sacredness of the life that goes into that pizza, we're not, we're not teasing about pizza. We're teasing about a fundamental view toward life. Now, are you a machine? Yes. No, you're not a machine. If you were a machine, here's how I could get to know you. I don't know all of you. Yeah. So, uh, so I'll pick somebody, and uh, we're going to meet you. And you come up here, we're going to lay you out on the table. We're going to dissect you, pick out your liver and your pancreas and your heart and your lungs and your teeth. We're going to lay you out here on the table. Here's Tom. <laughs> you know, we're going to run out of all these things. We're going to run out of air. You know, we're going to run out of sunlight. We're going to run out of warmth or cold or whatever. And we have this idea that um, that that we that we can live through all of this, and we don't have to be a part or participate in the healing or the change that's necessary to make a better world. You know, we love to think that everything we are in life, our situation, whatever our situation is, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. You ever say, it's not my fault? <laughs> because you know what? We hate to take responsibility, don't we? It's somebody else. I'm not smart because I have no parents. I can't make good grades because I don't have time to stop. Uh, I, you know, um, I can't uh, participate because I'm not good at that. I can't write because I've got a broken hand or whatever, okay? I can't be kind because somebody's abusing me. I can't be forgiving because I'm depressed. I can't be an encourager because nobody's encouraging me. We love to think that we're just victims. And we just and we just go from day to day, you know, crying in our own victimhood. <laughs> it's not my fault. It's all everybody else's fault. If all of those <coughs> if all those all my parents and all those those idiots at school and all those if, if all of them would just treat me right and do right and all this then I would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Not my fault. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Where you are, where I am, and where our world is is a result of billions of decisions. And the reality is, every one of us has been gifted 
beautifully blessed with gifts and talents. And none of us has all the gifts and talents necessary for the amount of healing and change that needs to be wrought in the world, do we? Not any one person can do it all. The Republicans can't do it all. The Democrats can't do it all. The, you know, the Americans can't do it all. Nobody can do it all. So every one of us has this wonderful, gifted, unique place within the change that we envision and want to see in the world. Sometimes our world can get pretty small when all we can see is what we're going through. Okay, well then focus on that little world and say, how can I be a healing part of this little world that consumes my attention? And if we will focus outside of ourselves and start serving and <laughs> sacrificing, there's that word again, sacrificing ourselves that others and the world may have life, we will do our part and fill our niche and bring sacredness to our lives. As we respect and honor and appreciate our beautiful giftedness, maybe it's speaking, maybe it's writing, maybe you're the fastest runner, maybe, maybe, you know what, maybe, Maybe you don't make good grades, but you have just a wonderful capacity to be charitable to other people, to find good things to say about other people. All of us have an ability to participate. And I would just suggest that in all of these crises that we read about, economic crises, soil crises, water crises, the biggest crisis we have is a crisis of participation. 